Nations innumerable and most savage have invaded all Gaul. The whole region between the Alps and the Pyrenees, the ocean and the Rhine, has been devastated by the Quadi, the Vandals, the Sarmati, the Alani, the Gepidi, the hostile Heruli, the Saxons, the Burgundians, the Alemanni, and the Pannonians. O oh, wretched empire, Mayence, formerly so noble a city, has been taken and ruined, and in the church many thousands of men have been massacred. Worms has been destroyed after a long siege. Rhymes, that powerful city, Imens, Eris, Spire, Strasbourg, all have seen their citizens led away and captive into Germany. Aquitaine and the province of Lyons and Narbonne, all save a few towns, have been depopulated. And these the sword threatens without, while hunger ravages within. I cannot speak without fears of Toulouse, without the merits of the holy bishop Exuperius have prevailed so far to save from destruction. Spain even is in daily terror lest it perish, remembering the invasion of the Cumbri, and whatsoever the other provinces have suffered once, they continue to suffer in their fear. I will keep silence concerning the rest, lest I seem to despair of the mercy of God. For a long time, from the Black Sea to the Julian Alps, those things which are ours have not been ours. And for thirty years since the damn new boundary was broken, war has been waged in the very midst of the Roman Empire. Our tears are dried by old age, except a few old men, all were born in captivity and siege and do not desire the liberty they never knew. Who could believe this? How could the whole tale be worthily told? How Rome has fought within her own bosom not for glory, but for preservation. Nay, how she has not even fought, but with gold and all her precious things has ransomed her life. Who could believe that Rome, built upon the conquest of the whole world, would fall to the ground? That the mother herself would become the tomb of her peoples? That all regions of the east, of Africa, and Egypt, once ruled by the queenly city, would be filled with troops of slaves and handmaidens. That today holy Bethlehem should shelter men and women of noble birth who once abounded in wealth and are now beggars. When we had returned to our tent, Oreste's father came to say that Attila invited both parties of us to dine with him about three o'clock that afternoon. We waited for the time of the invitation, and then all of us, the envoys from the Western Romans as well, presented ourselves in the doorway facing Attila. In accordance with national custom, the cupbearers gave us a cup for us to make our libations before we took our seats. When that had been done and we had sipped the wine, we went to the chairs where we would sit to have dinner. All the seats were arranged down either side of the room up against the walls. In the middle, Attila was sitting on a couch with a second couch behind him. Behind that, a few steps led up to his bed, which for decorative purposes was covered in ornate drapes made of fine linen, like those which Greeks and Romans prepared for marriage ceremonies. I think that more distinguished guests were on Attila's right and the second rank on his left, where we were with Borichos, a man of some renown among the Scythians, who was sitting in front of us. Onogesios was to the right of Attila's couch, and opposite of him were two of the king's sons on chairs. The eldest son was sitting on Attila's own couch, right on the very edge, with his eyes fixed on the ground in fear of his father. When all were sitting properly in order, a cupbearer came to offer Attila an ivy wood bowl of wine, which he took and drank a toast to the man first in order of precedence. The man thus honored rose to his feet, and it was not right for him to sit down again until Attila had drank some or all of the wine and had handed the goblet back to the attendant. The guests, taking their own cups, then honored him in the same way, sipping their wine after making a toast. One attendant went around to each man in strict order after Attila's personal cupbearer had gone out. When the second guest and then all the others in their turn had been honored, Attila greeted us in like fashion in our order of seating. A lavish meal served on silver trenchers was prepared for us and the other barbarians. But Attila just had some meat on a wooden platter, for this was one aspect of his self-discipline. For instance, gold and silver cups were presented to the other diners, but his own goblet was made of wood. His clothes, too, were simple, and no trouble was taken except to have them cleaned. The sword that swung by his side, the casps on his barbarian shoes, 
and the bridle of his horse were all free of gold, precious stones, and other valuable decorations affected by the other Scythians. As twilight came on, torches were lit, and two barbarians entered before Attila to sing some songs they had composed telling of his victories and his valor in war. The guests paid close attention to them, and some were delighted with the songs, others excited at being reminded of the wars, but others broke down and wept as if their bodies were weakened by age and their warrior spirits forced to remain inactive. After the songs, a Scythian entered, a crazy fellow who told a lot of strange and completely false stories, not a word of truth in them, which made everyone laugh. Following him came the Moor Zekron, totally disorganized in appearance, clothes, voice, and words. By mixing up the language of the Italians with those of the Huns and the Gauls, he fascinated everyone and made them break out into uncontrollable laughter. All that is, except Attila. He remained impassive, without any change of expression, and neither by word or gesture did he seem to share in the merriment, except that when his youngest son, Ernest, came in and stood by him, he drew the boy towards him and looked upon him with gentle eyes. I was surprised that he paid no attention to his other sons, and only had time for this one. But the barbarian at my side, who understood Italian and what I had said about the boy, warned me not to speak up and said that the seers had told Attilia that his family would be banished, but would be restored by this son. After spending most of the night at the party, we left, having no wish to pursue the drinking any further.